Happy Easter. In our first reading today from the Acts of the Apostles, we have one of the early homilies in the church's history, and it is a homily of St. Peter, and in it, St. Peter reminds those who are gathered together that the one that they had crucified, Jesus, is Lord and Christ. And their response to Peter was that this message was, what should we do? And St. Peter is very clear to them, you should repent and be baptized. All of you, he says, should repent and be baptized. He said, this is for all of you and for your children. And so we see one of the foundational texts that that indicate the early practice of the church to bring in whole families. Among those 3,000 who were brought into the church that day were were men, women, and children. And it was an early practice of the church that, that when a Christian family had another baby, they would have it baptized. Because it is a gift, it is a promise given to all of us. And so the church is teaching on infant baptism. We have a baptism after Mass today. It'll be fun. Actually, two of them after Mass today. Our baptism is the first stage when we become children of God. It's our entering into the new covenant where we become the adopted children of God through Christ. And so it is very important that every Easter we renew as a community our baptismal promises. It's a foundational sacrament. And one that we remember every time we come into the church, when we get to the Holy Water, we dip our hands in and we we bless ourselves in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, reminding ourselves that it's through baptism that we become part of the community. Now yesterday, we had a group of our, our kids. They've been coming in to receive their first Holy Communion at different times. We had a whole group yesterday. And Isaiah, yesterday, we did a sprinkling rite at the beginning to remind all the kids that they were baptized. And that was their first part of the journey. And I soaked them. And I just thought that it would be wrong if I didn't soak Isaiah Rosario today. (laughs) Elijah, I'm sorry, Elijah Rosario. Um, To remind him that you were born again. And this is a big day for you. I know I soaked your book. And I'll remind you that on June 1st, Elijah, you can soak me, okay? At our parish picnic this year, I will be getting soaked by anybody who wants to soak me. You can make up for all the times I've gone through the church and, and, and drowned you in water, okay? This will be your time to have, you want to do that, don't you? Yeah, you want to do that, yeah. You made your first communion yesterday. Yeah, how many, as a matter of fact, how many made their first re- your communion this year? If you guys can stand. Let's see those, and raise your hands up so we can see you. We got, oh look, we got a number of them here, and Elijah's gonna be joining you in just a few moments. You guys can have a seat, fantastic. So baptism is the foundational sacrament. But on this fourth Sunday of Easter, which is traditionally called Good Shepherd Sunday, We acknowledge God's call to continue to touch us with his presence through the ordained ministry. And we often spend some time today talking about vocations. Now, we've been very blessed as a community to have a number of of priests and religious come from our community. And uh, we have present with us one who on May the 24th, this month, May the 24th, Saturday, the 24th, will be ordained to the diaconate, to the transitional diaconate, and God willing, next year he'll be ordained to the priesthood. He's just back from the seminary, and maybe we can show him our support and our love as he stands. Don Bender, would you stand for us, our seminarian? (laughs) Don, um will be ordained by Bishop Gaynor on the 24th of May at St. Patrick's Cathedral at 10 a.m. 
on the 24th. Put it on your calendar. You are all invited to go to his ordination. Following the ordination, there'll be a reception at the Cardinal Keeler Center. You're welcome to come to that reception afterwards. And then at the 5.30 Mass that night on the 24th, Don will be preaching. And then on Sunday the 25th, he'll preach at the 8.30 and the 11 o'clock Mass. I get the weekend off. I know you're happy about that. <laughs> but we're certainly happy that Don will be preaching. We've been waiting for this day for a long time. So it's very exciting. Um, so we want to support him. And there'll be more information in the bulletin in the days ahead about our celebration here for, for Don. So it's Good Shepherd Sunday. And all of us who are conformed to Christ share in, in, in that shepherding. It is an image that our Lord Jesus Christ drew upon for himself. It's, it's, a, it's a title that he chose himself. And, and over time, we have romanticized this image of the good shepherd, of the shepherd. That's understandable. We have statues of the shepherd holding a sheep over his shoulders or paintings of the good shepherd. But the reality is, in Jesus' day and in many parts of the world, being a shepherd is not really a profession that one aspires to. It's basically an entry-level job, okay? It's kind of like um, the way I talk about one of my first jobs. I used to work offshore on boats servicing oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and in some sense, I romanticize that myself, you know, living on the water, living on a boat, servicing, you know, waking up in the morning to sunrises and going to sleep to sunsets on the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it sounds kind of nice, doesn't it? Yeah. It is a job that those down in Louisiana shun. They avoid it. Because the reality is, I was a deckhand. And we worked out in the sun, we sweat a lot, we worked with chemicals, we cleaned out mud tanks that were used in the drilling process, and we'd be covered with mud, we'd get covered with dry cement from the, from the dry tanks we worked with, we were covered in grease, diesel fuel, rust chips, paint, grime, and we stunk. We were smelly people. And people didn't want to hang out. Even the people that worked on the oil platforms didn't want to work around the boat people. Because not all of us showered every night either. We were smelly people. And that's the way it was for a shepherd. I mean, they were covered in grime. They sweat. They worked out in the heat of the sun. They spent all their time around animals, smelly animals. They slept in the dirt with these smelly animals. And they smelled. As a matter of fact, shepherding was prohibited in Jerusalem and their territory. The shepherds were relegated to the hill country. People didn't want to see them, even though they needed them. I mean, in the temple, they were sacrificing lambs and goats all the time. But they didn't want to know where those lambs and goats came from. It's kind of like us going to the grocery store. You know, we'll, we'll have a steak or something as long as it's, you know, wrapped in cellophane, you know, and looks pretty. We don't want to know where it came from, and we certainly don't want to know the people that had their hands on that meat before we got it. We don't. It was not a job one aspired to. I worked on the boats. We got paid by the day. It was a way they could avoid paying us the minimum wage. We got a daily wait rate. And we were on beck and call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I worked straight time, which meant seven days after seven days after seven days, month after month working straight time with a daily pay that didn't cover minimum wage. But I still made money because where are you going to spend money in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico? Any money I did make, I took home, so. But shepherds made almost nothing. No one wanted to be a shepherd. And yet Jesus grabs onto this image because of their humility. Because on their, 
their willingness to lay down their lives for the sheep. You see, in people's minds, the sheep that the shepherds guarded were more important than the shepherd. They wanted the sheep, they didn't care about the shepherd. And in grasping onto this image, Jesus is telling us that God came down to this earth to get dirty, to assume a position, a lowly position, a position that was devalued even below the sheep that he cared for. And it was the perfect image because the good shepherd does lay down his life for his sheep. He was one that that people shunned, who they didn't even want to look upon, especially when he was beaten and bruised, mocked. And yet we who are conformed to Christ are called to, to live in this image, to be willing to get dirty for one another. This is why Mother's Day touches us at the depths of our hearts when we celebrate our mothers today and our our fathers in June because we see in them good shepherds. We see in them the authority of their discipleship because conformed to Christ, they're willing to get dirty for us, to sacrifice for us, to lay down their lives for us. And so in them, we see the face of God. Jesus says, you will know them by their works. And we see the authority, the truth in our parents because of their love. They have been conformed to Christ. Our question of the week this week was simply, How do I know that I hear the voice of the Good Shepherd? And we recognize that voice in the authority of the witness of those who are conformed to Christ, like our mothers. Hopefully, like those who are ordained to the ministry, that they're willing to serve selflessly. Hopefully, we see that in his mystical body in one another, that we are willing to get dirty for one another, to sacrifice for one another, to suffer and sweat for one another. We certainly hear the voice of the Good Shepherd in the authority of the Word. We hear the voice of the Good Shepherd in our conscience, that that voice within us that tells us what is right and what is wrong, for we certainly can't turn to, to civil law which condones abortion, contraception, and pornography, and all kinds of horrors, we don't turn to civil law to know what is right and wrong. We hear the voice of the shepherd within us speaking, speaking the truth. We we know the voice of the good shepherd in our prayer lives. And this is central to all of those things because without a prayer life, without a relationship with Christ, we'll begin to not see God's love in our parents in our community, in our authoritative leaders. Without a prayer life, the Word of God will will not burn in our hearts, but rather it will ring empty. Without a prayer life, our conscience will be deadened. And so, in the midst of this season of the resurrection, as we seek to experience and to know the risen Christ in our midst, As Elijah gets ready to experience Jesus' presence in the breaking of the bread, we ask the Lord to keep our prayer lives alive. We recommit ourselves to our prayer lives that we may recognize him in our midst, that we may recognize his voice, that we may know that Christ is truly alive. He is risen. And he is here.